Now I'll discuss some remaining controversial issues with respect to the cosmos. So there are many. I'll discuss five of them over here. So one by one we'll discuss these. Now one of the things that people ask that the modern understanding and the Vedic understanding of eclipses. So are eclipses caused by Rahu? And it seems like a, a childhood fairy tale that some some monster comes and eats the sun or eats the moon. And then what happens? Does he excrete the sun or the moon or what? how does it come out? So people make fun of this. Uh, but actually if you look at the Vedic explanation, it's much more sophisticated. So let's try to understand this. So, so this is the current scientific understanding of how eclipses happen. So we have the sun, the moon uh, and the earth. So when the moon comes in between the sun and the earth, then the part of the moon where the moon's shadow will fall, that will not see the sun. <clears throat> and that is called a solar eclipse. And now, because two images are brought together over here, the moon cannot be at both places at the same time. But if the moon is on the other side, hmm, uh, so when the lunar eclipse will happen is <clears throat> that the moon we will not be able to see because the moon basically gets the reflection, reflects the light from the sun. And if the earth is blocking the moon, then the sun's light doesn't reach the moon. And that's why the moon, we can't see it. So that is how eclipses happen and that is the modern understanding and at least from a functional perspective, it's accurate. We are able to predict eclipses with a substantial level of accuracy, accuracy using this model. So now what is the Vedic understanding? So this becomes a little more subtle and so sophisticated. Mm. Okay. So you will see the sun is in the middle and you see one big circle around it. That is the path of the moon, sorry, of the earth going around the sun. That's the big circle. But now if you see on the right side or where, let's look at the right, right side, you see the moon and the, there is a circle going around the moon. So now the significant point is that the moon's rotation uh, uh, is not, the moon's motion is not in the same plane as the sun's motion. So yeah. So if the, uh, the sun's plane is like this, sun's motion is in this plane, the moon's motion is in this plane. So there's an angle I just, uh, mentioned over there. So now what happens because of this is that only when not only the three objects have to be in the same line, but the, the everything also has to be in the same plane. So eclipses will happen only when all of them are in the same plane. And you will see these two happen they are called as a nodes, you see in the, in the top and below you will see there are two nodes. Hmm? So only when uh, the objects are at, the, at that particular location and uh, when, so when the earth is in a nodal point and then the moon comes in between the earth and the sun, then an eclipse will occur. Hmm. Now uh, to take this forward, that nodal plane or nodal point is significant because of particular reason. So now the Surya Siddhanta describes the location of Rahu and Ketu. So Rahu and Ketu, they are, they are non-line reflecting planets. So they are not visible to us. Hmm? Just like we discussed, so much in the universe is not visible. So Rahu and Ketu is also not visible. But precisely their location is at the nodes. So the, the place where the moon's plane and the earth's plane intersect, that is the place where Rahu and Ketu are there. So in that sense, both Rahu and the alignment of the sun, moon and earth, both happen at the same time. So the alignment of sun, moon and earth is that, that cosmic explanation is not denied. But when that happens, Rahu and Ketu also happen to be there at that time. So now so that's why both explanations can work in parallel. Yeah, <laughs> okay. I'll just explain this further and we'll have a question about it. So, so what happens is that the explanations here are not contradictory, they are complementary. Complementary means both explanations can work at the same time. And now somebody might say that actually then Rahu and Ketu are not needed only. Anyway, the sun and moon and the earth, they can come in one line, then automatically it will happen. Yes, from a physical perspective, yes, there is the three coming together will cause the physical event, the eclipse. Mm -hmm. But from a Shastric perspective, 
eclipse is not just a physical event that physical event is associated with certain cosmic effects or certain malefic effects certain inauspicious effects and those effects are caused by rahu and ketu so when it is said that okay during eclipses we should fast or we should do some sacred activities we should avoid certain activities that is not simply because in the past people were so superstitious or oh, suddenly it has become dark suddenly we can't see the sun so you can't see the moon oh that's why we should pray now it is not just that there is rahu and ke because rahu and ketu are having an influence at that time so that creates an inauspicious effect so the eclipses are not just a physical phenomena the physical cause cause of eclipse can be explained in terms of the sun moon and earth being in one line but the inauspiciousness associated with the eclipses is caused by rahu and ketu and uh, in the now because rahu and ketu are strong negative influences that's why their location needs to be known and as far as the sura siddhanta or other siddhanta jyoti shastras are there there is no other way described to know their location apart from their position at the nodes so in that sense the eclipses uh, eclipses are the way to know when rahu and ketu uh, influence when rahu and ketu are going to have an influence so the location is known through the method of the eclipse now the bhagavatam's language is a little more careful sometimes whenever any story is there in sanskrit when it's translated into english there are different ways it could be translated and often the translator's agenda or bias comes into the picture so the bhagavatam if we look at the sanskrit it doesn't say it it devours it says it covers so covering and devouring are two different things and devouring can also be used in a metaphorical sense in the bhagavad gita it says mahashano mahapapma Ma, so lust is all devouring proper translate now what does it devour you know even a lusty person is still existing it is not that they, they like not like a crocodile or alligator that has devoured something so that devouring can also refer in a not non literal sense to the lust devours the intelligence of a person that means the intelligence stops functioning so rahu and ketu they devour the sun and the moon that means their influence in terms of their luminosity stops manifesting so it's not talking about a physical devouring it is talking about even when the word devouring is used it is more in the metaphorical sense to refer to their influence being eclipsed being overcome they no longer manifest at that time is this explanation clear from this diagram or do i need to should i explain anything once again yeah and if it's not clear i can explain and if you don't care it doesn't matter <laughs> <laughs> it's just that sometimes sometimes we don't need to know we need to know someone who knows <laughs> that's also enough so just if somebody makes fun of this there's no need to makes fun of this there's no need to get bewildered so there is a sufficiently sophisticated explanation for this okay thank you so we'll discuss various things one by one i discuss about eclipses now then there is another controversial statement which sometimes prabhupad says which simply agitates people i right? this prabhupad seems to say that the sun is closer to the earth than the moon now people who know some amount of cosmology say that if it were like that we would be we would not be able to live and the mercury is the closest planet neither mercury nor venus are actually suitable for human habitation because they're just too hot so what is prabhupad saying actually when he says things sun is closer to the earth so this is the question so uh, the moon is not that far away that's what modern cosmology tells us so how do we understand it so the bhagavatam's vision itself is different when it talks about distances it's talking about distances from a different perspective it's it's a vision based on the evolution of consciousness of the residents and within the bhagavatam's uh, bhagavatam's uh, universal description there is a vertical dimension vertical is not just physically up it is in terms of karma like i mentioned heaven is up so there is a vertical dimension to the universe in the cosmos and then when we say the swarga loka is above and satya loka is above that that is in terms of a karmic hierarchy now we may depict it in terms of a geographical hierarchy when we draw diagrams of the universe but there is much more to the description of the universe so with this basic understanding of the vision of the universe now let's move forward so here 
let's consider three buildings so there's somebody living in flat a on the ground floor yeah i'll just come to that yeah so so that's so at the bottom of the, uh, the flat a ground level is the earth so at the right that's the right the right side so now somebody is are living here and then far away from them somebody is living hmm? so that is the sun the, that is the left left top left most flat the, uh, flat, uh, the, the white the yellow one that is the flat C okay so flat A is the earth flat C is the sun and flat B you will see it's at a very high level it's, you can say it's at the 20th level but it is very close so when Prabhupada is saying the sun is closer than the earth it's closer to the earth than the moon he is referring it in terms of the vertical dimension vertical dimension means the height of the sun is in terms of height the sun's plane is closer to the earth's plane than the moon's plane if you consider the plane then the sun is closer in its plane but not in the geographical distance so the earth is at the ground level the sun is at the second level so earlier I also described that the earth is the Bhumandala and the Anmanasottar Parvat the sun is moving around but the Soma is way above so flat B is horizontally if we consider in terms of horizontal dimensions flat B is much closer to flat A so here now we have three ways of measuring distance one is look at the planes of all the three places the plane in which they are existing the earth the sun and the moon if you look at the three planes and measure the distance between them then the sun is closer to the earth than the moon but if we look at it in terms of the horizontal distance the sun is much much further away and then if we look at the effective distance that is the diagonal distance even in the diagonal distance also the sun is much further away so when Prabhupada is talking about the sun being closer it is primarily in terms of the plane at which the sun is existing it's not the physical distance of the sun to the earth but the distance of the solar plane to the earth's plane so that, that yeah, the Manasot, just now we, just, when we started the class it is described that the solar plane is at a particular level Prabhupada mentions like that, plane. no that is the Bhagavatam itself is saying that the, the sun exists at a particular height and then in between there are the Kim Purusha Loka and the Upadevata Lokas and then below that there is the earth but the Swarga Lokas are way above the Swarga Lokas have already been described and Chandra exists over there so, so this particular dimensions yes these dimensions of, about the heights of various planes that's mentioned in the Bhagavatam itself okay so this is the resolution for that particular distance conundrum so now we'll discuss one more thing that is Bhagavatam sometimes gives dimensions for earthly objects that seem to be unbelievable so for example the Himalayas are said to be thousands of miles high so how exactly is it possible we know that the Himalayas are not we have climbed on top of the Himalayas many people have so here the concept of Adhikar comes up so the idea is that the universe is like a complex computer a simple example to understand this so if there's a very very sophisticated high-end computer then a data entry operator might be working on that computer and they may have access to only a small portion of the computer you enter data over here you enter data over here that's all and apart from that they may not be able to access anything else and for them the computer is only maybe this 50 GB but actually the computer might have 50 terabyte of data but somebody who has uh, who has the appropriate level of access maybe the CEO or the, the top officers they can get all the 50 TB uh, data so although they are accessing both are accessing the same computer they are not accessing at the same level so similarly just like a computer can have multiple levels of access so similarly the universe there are certain objects in the universe which can be accessed at different levels by different people just like even if physically we go to Chandraloka we access it only in three dimensions we don't access the higher levels of Chandraloka so similarly the, just like the Ganga we perceive the Ganga as it flows through Gangotri here but the Ganga as it, Ganga as it exists in the higher levels in, in the, if the higher planets themselves are subtle then the water also there is going to be subtle 
So, so the Ganga which is in the higher levels, we will not be able to perceive it from here. So similarly the Himalayas, they exist on the earth and they exist at higher levels of reality also. So they, the same hard disk, it, has, it is seen as having different amounts of data by different people. Similarly the Himalayas, depending on the Adhikar, it is seen differently by different people. So this is also called as state specific knowledge. That means the, the knowledge that we pursue depends, depends on the state of our consciousness. To some extent quantum physics talks a lot about this that in the state that it is the observer who determines what can be seen. And if the observer is uh, not there then the perception will be different. Now Einstein himself found quantum physics very difficult to, difficult to accept. One of his famous quotes condemning quantum physics is that he said, I would like to believe that the moon continues to exist even if I am not looking at it. He will say obviously the moon continues to exist but according to quantum physics it doesn't. Quantum physics there are actually there are simply waves and when there is an observer then the waves, waves coagulate and we see gross objects at that time. So we are not going to go into quantum physics but the idea of state specific knowledge that the observer determines the observation that is something which is not alien to science. So similarly, the, uh, depending on the state of consciousness of the observer, certain areas of the universe are pursued and certain aren't pursued. So when you talk about perceiving higher realities, how are they to be perceived? There are broadly three things over there. There is some amount of visual perception, but there is also to be intellectual comprehension. And then after that, there is spiritual realization. So when all these three come together, that's when we perceive. And this applies for Himalayas. This also applies, say, for Vrindavan. Now we may go to Vrindavan, but we don't see Vrindavan just by going seeing with it our eyes. Now still seeing with our eyes is important. Still we are recommended that we go to Vrindavan. But don't go there with a the sightseeing mood. We go there with, yes, we see with our eyes, but our eyes are guided by the description of scriptures. And not only are they guided by the description of scriptures, but our heart is, is filled with the devotion that comes by associating with great devotees. And then we pursue those higher realities. So the same is depicted in a different way. If you consider a triangle, these three things, sensory perception, scriptural description, and then prayerful contemplation or spiritual realization. So as these three increase, then we see the dham more and more. So we see with our eyes, but don't just see with our eyes. We remember with our head or, and then we pray with our heart. Then the divine Vrindavan will be revealed to us. So all three need to be combined together. So now we move to the Vedic planetarium. So now this is probably the uh, one of the most ambitious projects that our movement has taken up. Ambitious in terms of not just the funds required or in terms of the magnificence of the temple that is being built, but also in terms of the every attempt to depict a planetarium. So I would like to now read out Although the planetarium is one of the biggest projects that Prabhupada has talked about, the number of times he has talked about is not many. He's talked about it with several of his followers, and there are about eight, eight quotes where Prabhupada talks about the purpose of the planetarium. So we will look at that and we'll get a sense of what was Prabhupada's vision when he wanted this planetarium. So I prefer those who have not read till now, maybe they can take the mic and read. What we need to explain. Now, all you PhDs must carefully study the details of the fifth candle and make a working model of the universe. If we, if we can explain the passing seasons, eclipses, phases of the moon, passing of day and night, etc., then it will be very powerful propaganda. Letter from Srila Kaupadu Swarup Dhamadal Das, April 27, 1976. Yes, thank you. So Prabhupada actually uh, envisioned the idea of a planetarium quite late and that's why there are not many quotes of Prabhupada. So it's interesting Prabhupada also uses the word model over here. We a working and that all this is a working model. Why? Because the universe is too complex. We can't know how it is. But if we can get a working model that explains basic things that we observe in the universe, then Prabhupada said that will be a powerful propaganda. So this is where we, we don't want to dismiss the whole Bhagavatam's description as divine and say it's of no relevance. We do want to come up with a, uh, come up with a Murky Goki model as much as possible. Prabhupada also wanted that. At the same time, 
it's not that everything that is there in the universe we, we will be able to perceive it empirically or demonstrate it empirically we'll come to that so that is the basic purpose what is required for the planetarium now what is the planetarium about magnificent temple that is our plan to make a very big temple and to show all the planetary systems within that form famous bhagavata it will not be an ordinary temple so that people from the whole world they will come See Jara contemplation. Say Bhagavatam 798, Mahaprabhu 1976. This is a class on Bhagavatam. So again, you see, mostly 1976 and 77. Moonshine like attractiveness. He further revealed, I have named this temple Sri Mayapur Chandrodevanya, the rising moon of Mayapur. Now make it rise bigger and bigger until it becomes the full moon. And this moon sign will be spread all over the world, all over India. They will come to see from all over the world. They will come later to Rameshwar, Vishwanath, October 1974. Written by Brahmanand, initiated by Sri Prabhupada. Initialed. Yeah. So, so many times Prabhupada would directly dictate the letters. And some, or Prabhupada was sometimes too busy or sometimes too sick. Then he would just paraphrase, you write this. And then the disciples would write in their words. But then, so then they would sign, the particular disciple would sign it and Prabhupada would countersign it. That's I have read it and I authorized it. So Prabhupada answered his correspondence in two different ways and at different times. So, especially when he was sick, he would do this. So, this is a little earlier, 1974. Attract more people. People are already coming from all parts of the world to see Mayapur and join in the Sankirtan movement. So if something more attractive is learned, more people will come from all parts of the world. Letter to B. R. Sridhar Maharaj, Los Angeles 6 June 1976. Yeah. So he's writing to his god brother now, so that we want to attract more people to come here. Now this is the famous pastime which Ambarish Prabhu tells. So Ambarish Prabhu tells that the background is that he says that you know, Prabhupada, I heard about uh, that you are going to build something. It seems wonderful. Then Prabhupada says, yeah, Finance worker, so He also like, so finance this project, very planned way, from this to. Where will this be? Prabhupada, Mayapur, my idea is to attract people of the world and world to Mayapur. So it was like a casual subject which came up in the conversation and that has become the life mission of Ambarish Prabhu now. So oh, you like it, so finance it. <laughs> so Prabhupada was like that. If somebody told that they can light a matchstick, you become in charge of electricity for the whole project. <laughs> like that. Yes. We are acquiring 350 acres of land from life from constructing a small township. I think we, Prabhupada, to attract people from all the world to see the planet in conversation, July 6, 1976, passing from DC. So there's a township, and within the township, there's a planetarium, and that people will come to see that. Now, this is a little more specific. Automatically advertised, Rupa, would people will come to see the way... World people. Would world, people world. will come to see the way the planetary systems come out of Krishna. We should advertise it very widely that this is the actual factual explanation of the universe. Rupa, this will be automatically advertised. As soon as the temple is finished, people will come like anything. Yeah, so Prabhupada does not go in the direction, this is the actual factual. Prabhupada says, no, the advertisement will automatically be done. So the advertisement is that people come and more and more people will come. So this is 18 March 18, 1976, Mayapur. Simple living, high thinking. Dear Mr. Hunter, please accept my greetings. I beg to acknowledge the receipt of your letter with enclosed contribution towards the development of our Mayapur city in West Bengal. And I thank you very much. We are trying to construct a city where people from all over the world can come to visit and live according to the wedding tenets 
of simple living and hiking gear. I am pleased to hear that you are appreciative of our humble efforts and if you would like to contribute in the future towards this great spiritual city, you can send your contributions to me care of. You are sincerely AC Bhakti Viranda Swami, AC BPS Cares, letter to Mr. Randall, Los Angeles, June 1976. Yeah. So it's interesting, he, he also mentioned the planetarium in his letter. In general, what has happened in, our, in the Veda base? We have the letters that Prabhupada wrote. We don't have the letters that were written to Prabhupada. Why? Because many times uh, it was a conscious policy that was decided by, by the Veda base managers that because many devotees wrote their personal problems and uh, they didn't want it to be those problems to be public. So those letters we don't have. But from the context, we know that actually this was Prabhupada. It, it, he also wanted to contribute to the planetarium, and Prabhupada says we are building this for simple living, high thinking. Help us make this diagram, Prabhupada. No, persons, we are not very much concerned. We are immediately we want the diagram, how to fix it up so that people can see. This is the situation. So you made this diagram, Indian astronomer. It is first attempt to give him picture the ideas of Bhagavadam. Proper. Yes, so we, we are, we have got very good scheme so that people from the world will come to see the basic idea of the angry system. This is the ambition. So you kindly help us. Morning conversation, April 30, 1977, Bombay. So it was extraordinarily ambitious. The astrologer says they never done this before. <laughs> you know, you, they used it some, some calculations for Jyotisha. But to actually depict it was a big challenge. And Prabhupada consulted various experts and at that time he was disappointed because nobody actually did anything tangible. What is the last quote? Exhibit India's very culture. The plans for this very large project are being taken solely from the references found in Pip Kandoshan and Bhagavatam and its authoritative commentaries by important Acharyas, along with other Puranas and Samhitas like Brahma Samhita etc. As you can appreciate, the work involved in this project will be gigantic and the advice of many experts from all fields will be needed to make it come out successful. It will be a glorious exhibition of India's Vedic culture that will attract visitors from all over the world. Letter from Shira Gopal to S.L. Dhani, November 14, 1976. Yes. So Prabhupada says several things based on the Shastra, we will need the cooperation of experts and then it will exhibition of Vedic culture. So now these are all the statements Prabhupada has directly on the purpose of the planetarium. Now to summarize it, what are the purpose? It says attract people to Mayapur. That is the main thing. Where they could be Krishna conscious city of simple living, high thinking and where the visitors may learn about the Vedic worldview and Krishna consciousness in general. And how is the method for that? Build a big beautiful temp temple which contains a planetarium showing the universe according to the Srimad Bhagavatam. Now, unfortunately, if we look at much of the propaganda that goes out in social media and other places, there are many secondary purposes which are not mentioned in even one of the letters of Srila Prabhupada that come up. So, challenging the scientists, defeating the scientists, revealing advanced science in the Bhagavatam, spelling the downfall of Western civilization, convincing people of the empirical truth of the fifth canto. Prabhupada doesn't mention even one of these in any of his letters. Now, there might be something which Prabhupada, Prabhupada has talked about challenging the scientists elsewhere, he has talked about, but challenging the scientists, it's usually in terms of life comes from life. That consciousness doesn't come from matter. So, it's like, now devotees may often be well-intentioned, but they take one purpose and transpose it on another context. The purpose of the planetarium was not to challenge or defeat the scientists. The purpose of the planetary model also not. Now, now this doesn't mean that we, sh we can, in certain areas, we can challenge and defeat the scientists. If possible, we can also show the advanced science in the Bhagavatam. But that is not the purpose that Srila Prabhupada wanted for the planetary. So, why am I saying this? That somehow, in general, sometimes things are made more confrontational than, need, than they need to be. Prabhupada's purpose in having the planetary was not confrontational. It was more a cultural depiction to attract people. So when we take a confrontational mode, it unnecessarily increases hostilities. So 
the cosmograph so if we consider each tradition or at least our tradition has something distinctive to present so from if we want to pers look at it from scientific perspective the idea of consciousness having a non-material source that is a very big field of study now consciousness studies is one of the biggest advancing fields in science today so we have something to pr present over there if we go into theology then the idea of a loving divinity an all attractive all loving person krishna that is something extraordinary other traditions don't have such a vivid and attractive conception of god so we have our tradition has something significant to provide uh, either to world science or to world theology but if we take a confrontational approach with respect to the planetarium unnecessarily we distract energy and the purpose was not confrontation it was more of a cultural depiction as far as Prabhupada's his own statements are concerned and that brings me to the last part now that we, how do we resolve the science scripture conflicts so we discussed this whole cosmology in such a way that whatever descriptions of the cosmos are there they can be understood with a by a reasonable person not that everything can be understood but there can be a reasonable understanding where one doesn't have to reject science to accept scripture so this is the last part i'll take about how science scripture conflicts can be resolved so basically if you consider scriptural knowledge as a big circle some of it will agree with science some of it will disagree with science and some of it will transcend science now for the purpose of depiction i have seen these three circles in a particular size uh, but actually speaking if you see most of scriptural knowledge will fall in this category of transcend science that that god is a bluish black cowherd boy who lives in a pastoral paradise well science can neither prove this nor disprove it it's just beyond the domain of science so most of scriptural knowledge falls in the category of that which transcend science and if we look at our own lives when we are practicing scripture we practice family that aspect of scripture which transcends science that is what matters to us the most that is what we relish that is what we that is what we learn from and that is what we grow by <coughs> so like now most of you have been performing the austerity of hearing these three classes on cosmology for the 3 days you are still austerity land in the 10 10 15 minutes hopefully so but it, this doesn't really matter much for us when we are practicing bhakti because when we are practicing bhakti okay we may use science but what our focus is how can i improve my consciousness in general also when people practice spirituality they want to become maybe manage their emotions better maybe become more forgiving become more uh, sensitive more kind hearted have some kind of meaning and purpose in their lives so people when they come to spirituality and they come to spiritual wisdom texts that is for some knowledge that transcends science so the our approach the way it can be is if there are some things in, in scripture which agree with science we use those things to help people get faith in scripture so that they can start focusing on that part of scripture which transcends science and if there are some things in scripture which disagree with science we have to manage them in such a way that that doesn't become a obstacle for people to come towards the section which transcends science so the whole idea is get people to the section of scripture which is transcendental and manage the other two sections first to give faith and the other to avoid damage to faith so cosmology if we consider from that perspective the cosmological descriptions will fall in which which of these categories yes at one level some of the description of the cosmos is transcend science if we talk about the spiritual world but some of the descriptions of say some things which we observe this is into contradict science so our idea should be that how do we manage this contradiction so get people off that onto the area that is transcendent so don't obsess on this because we ourselves don't dwell too much on it so why do why should we have people who are new dwell on it so now is now somebody might say is there something that transcends science what happens science is basically a horizontal bar and then the horizontal bar expands but it expands only vertically it does so that which is beyond knowledge always stays beyond knowledge so science knowledge expands in one domain and that domain is the domain of matter so we may know a lot of things but we know things only in the domain of matter 
like science is the study of matter spirituality is the study of what matters of what matters what is important in life there are 10 things which is more important which is less important so when arjuna came to krishna he is not interested in learning dhanurvidya he has already learned that is the study of matter he has already learned it from elsewhere but at that time what is it that matters does protecting the lives of my elders matter or does not killing bhishma bhishma and drona matter does it matter that we gain the kingdom back what matters most the spirituality is the study of what matters so science has its scope and spirituality has its scope so science is based on assumptions and axioms and it leads it leads to powerful understanding in a particular area but it's incomplete understanding it is silent about existence purpose and value existence means why do we exist at all that question is not answered purpose what are we meant to live for and while living how do i choose should i choose to do a or do b the values we live for that is something which science itself can't tell us it is we who have to choose so these are things which science doesn't provide and scripture provides us that that's why faith and inquiry can faith means learning from scripture and inquiry means the rational spirit of inquiry both can coexist and they can complement each other so what would be the attitude towards science somebody might say it's right and anything that is not accepted by science we reject it that would be that is actually not science that is called a scientism it's imperialism in the name of science because science itself doesn't claim that it tells everything about everything what science says is it offers natural explanation for observed phenomena so that's within the definition of science itself so one extreme to science is to say that science is right always the other extreme is to say that science is wrong and unless you reject your faith in science you cannot really have faith in scripture it's not like that within is it's useful useful means that we learn the purpose of living from scripture and while living in the world science is a useful tool so just like there could be many useful tools say we learn the purpose of living to raise our consciousness and attain krishna from shastra but if our health falls sick ayurveda could be one tool for recovering allopathy could be one tool there could be unani could be some tool there are so many other tools for recovering so these are useful tools sometimes they may work sometimes they may not work if they work use it so our approach towards science can be yukta vairagya that we use it to the extent it is useful and we don't have to necessarily reject it nor do we have to necessarily accept it and then this brings us to the conclusion of the section yeah would somebody like to read this what the last three verses of the whole section cosmology they reiterate the purpose who has the mic the repeat that this universal form is considered the vast body of the lord ready here and teaching about this increases once krishna's con- krishna consciousness first control the mind by thinking of external form then gradually think of the spiritual form yes so the whole purpose is thank you right it is to increase our krishna consciousness and because our consciousness is externally oriented so have some external object for thinking about so now for us there could be various external objects the dham the temple the deities they are all external objects the sevas that we do they are also external objects so whichever external objects can enhance our consciousness we use those we respectfully use those and then we move onward toward krishna so this is in that sense one tool we have to see whether it enhances our krishna consciousness then read here it we discussed earlier about rasa lila if it doesn't enhance our krishna consciousness then there's no need to use it and then see when we are preaching seek to give people peace of mind not a peace of your mind sometimes we just feel you know you are wrong and i'll prove to you are wrong and then what happens in giving a peace of our mind to people we take away their peace of mind and they become agitated i can't accept this so we need to put first things first that now what as i said earlier this cosmology it doesn't matter to us when we are practicing bhakti so much so then why should we make it matter to those who are just taking a bhakti no our purpose is to make their path easier to krishna not make their path tougher so it like say sunday feast is there and you know for everybody who comes to sunday feast we have simply khichdi and for insiders we have opulent feast you know that would be improper 
you know we don't make those who visit temple life more difficult for them than necessary so so what applies to it it's what applies to say giving food it also applies to giving philosophy we don't have to make people's journey to krishna more intellectually hostile or intellectually difficult than it needs to be so prabhupada was expert in removing obstacles from people's people's path and prabhupada famously would give explanations in a way that could gel with people I and mean, prabhupada was asked what is the joy of lsd oh, sorry what is the joy of the spiritual world now prabhupada told the seven offenses where he says that one of the offenses is to give some mundane interpretation of the holy name but prabhupada told that what is the joy of krishna consciousness of the spiritual world it is like a ocean of lsd now is that offensive interpretation not at all it's not offensive it is accessible and it is the expertise of the preacher to give an explanation that is accessible to the audience so but to, to the extent we do that to that extent we are actually helping people come to krishna and that's our responsibility so thank you very much for your patient as attention and your austere participation <laughs> hare krishna shri prabhupad ki santraj shrimad bhagavatam ki gaur premanande